The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Are you having conversations with clients about retirement? Are they asking how much money they'll need? Are they worried they'll run out? We're proud to introduce the new North Retirement Space on Ensemble, featuring Q&As with economists, webinars with product innovators, and unfettered access to retirement specialists to support your advice. Join the conversation today with North, a better way for retirement. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Chris Chapman from McQueen Group today. Chris, you're coming to me all the way from Brisbane. I'm down here in Melbourne. We're at opposite ends of the country just about at the moment. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, no problem, James. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolute privilege to be able to come and, yeah, speak today. <laughs> Let's uh, share your story and, and and what you're up to at McQueen. So I've, I've, I swear somewhere along the lines I've seen this probably no no Nowaki had how do I pronounce his name uh, Nowaki, Nowaki. yeah yeah I think I've seen him present at a conference somewhere or other like McQueen's a bit of a, a beast of a business isn't it it's not a one man one man band no. kind of thing what tell us a bit no. about McQueen yeah so I mean it was started by um like our founder um, Gus or Angus uh, McQueen so he he started it oh geez I don't want to get the number wrong because I don't want him to sound older than he probably actually is. But no, he started it uh, quite a while ago. I think we it was 20 or 25 years recently we celebrated as yeah. a business. So, um, which is, you know, incredible achievement. It's, it's, it's been around for quite a while and, um, yeah, it started off, started off with him. Um, you know, over the years, advisors have come and gone, it's grown. Um, and now, you know, it's incorporated accounting, lending. Um, and so, and then it's, it's sort of branched out, which is sort of how I fit into the business up into Brisbane as well. So, uh, like, yeah, so it, it's a pretty, yeah, like you said, it's, it's not sort of a one man operation. It's quite sizable. Um, and yeah, but I think the thing that I love most about it is even though it has been around for quite a while, we're all, we're all quite quite young per, per se um that you know there's not really many crusty crusty old people sort of hanging around in the business it's everyone's sort of middle age and and that's sort of i guess one of the big benefits of working there is that they have been quite quite open to you know giving giving younger people a chance and letting them come through and, and sort of really take take ownership of the business and not necessarily just just be a be a cog in the in the bigger business so, interesting yeah. that you say that too actually I, like i I looked at the the website before we before we started yeah. recording, and I have it open, kind of in the background behind your screen yeah. as we're as as we're recording this. And you're right, like looking at the faces here, there's a lot of young people, and they're not just young people in admin type roles. Like it says, they're accountants or they're you know they're client service manager, they're associate. Yeah. Like you look at yeah. you, you know, you're a, you're a partner. You you mentioned you kind of head up the, the, the Brisbane business, which we'll get into in a, in, a, in a second. But yeah, yeah, there's seemingly younger people in positions of seniority within the business, which is fantastic. Yeah, and I think, like I said, that they they really um, they really just back back young people to, to to do the work. So I guess there's no throwing people in the deep end. There might be an element of that, but I, there's obviously. I think people have shown that they're able to measure a competency and they're re- willing to give them an opportunity and back them in. And and I think that that's probably the thing that probably I appreciate most working in there is that I know that they've always got my back. I know that I can go to them if if I make a mistake and they'll they'll help me and they'll coach me through that. But at the second time as well, they they they're not sort of micromanaging. They trust me to really come up with ideas and share them and and run with them and and sort of test ideas even if we need to so which is which is it's good it's it's i really enjoy it so yeah from, from personally like in that career progression through the yeah. through the business because you know one of the advantages of working in a bigger business is that there's there can often be opportunities to to progress within the one organization rather than having to jump around yeah. like do you have like a is there a documented career path that hey if you want to go from 
you know, some entry level type role to being a partner of the firm, whatever description yeah. you use. Like, is there a is there a documented pathway, or people find their way through it? Like, how does that how does it work? Yeah, look, to be honest, no. It's yeah. probably something that we've um we've actually been investing a lot of time recently in a lot of those discussions because, like, listening to this podcast and and the wider industry, the real challenge is getting more advisors into into the business and bringing them through. And not only that, particularly with professional year. You want to make sure that if you train them, you've got something to offer them so that they hang around and, and really contribute and invest in the business and they don't feel like that there's a lid on their progression. So uh, I think that, yeah, no, there, there hasn't been. I think in the past, it's been very much uh, um, sort of come in, you know, show your stripes and just move forward. And there probably will be elements of that. But I guess, yeah, we're sort of trying to put together a bit more of a documented pathway and really work through that because I, I look at some of the other businesses um, that that are doing this really well. People that you've had on the podcast as well. Sometimes my mind's just gone, just <laughs> exploding, listening to it all, and and I probably come up with more ideas than 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 are really practical to implement. But at the same time, I think that it is really important moving forward to really have that clarity around that, particularly even just with Generation Z and and their their entry into the workplace. I think that that's where they'll get a lot of value from at. Um, yeah, as they move into the workforce and become advisors and and end up running businesses like ours one day. So, yeah, yeah. So, so what? So, what's your role with within the group? You, you're an advisor, but do you have? Yeah. Is there more that you'd be doing than just yeah. an advisor? What do you? Yeah. Thinking? So, so for the last probably a year and a half, I've headed up the Brisbane office, which is which is pretty cool. It's um again, awesome opportunity. Um, I, I kind of, I won't say I fell into it, but it's it sort of um. The when I sort of came into the business, um, they I, I came across as uh, I guess a senior associate sort of role, um, and and well, it was a senior associate. And the idea was that I would help assist other advisors in the short term, but the plan was to bring on more work. And as I brought on more work, the associate work would shrink, and the advice work would you know I, I have more clients. There's sort of that natural progression and transition, so it was quite quite good in a lot of ways. And and primarily, my focus was dealing with, I guess, sort of a, you know like some bigger accounts and two and working with two partners that were in Brisbane. Um, and then for for a couple of different reasons, both of those partners decided to sort of leave leave. One left the industry, the other sort of went through a bit of a, a bit of a life change and sort of realized he wanted to do do different things with his life, which which is fine. And and um and so they transitioned out, and then that sort of left me with all of a sudden <laughs> I am Brisbane, though, so, <laughs> um, which. Like it was a bit nerve wracking and scary at the time, but it, it's been it's been some hard yak over the last eighteen months. But sort of building those relationships and, and and really working hard to to sort of do that. But at the same time, yeah, it's good. I've sort of bedded a lot of that down, tidied up the book a bit because there were probably some. Um, I don't like using the word unprofitable clients, but I guess that's sort of the best way to think about it in the industry. Some people who probably don't need to be on an ongoing service arrangement moving forward. Um, so there was a lot of tidying that up and just getting the business nice and clean and and ready to sort of I guess grow because I think there's a lot of opportunity up here in Brisbane. Um, yeah, but, uh, everyone I talk to, it's the amount of people who are moving here, the demographics, everything that's sort of there's a lot of tailwinds behind it that are favourable for the industry. So it's just having nice clean you know uh, setup and and being able to be and be positioned to to get out there and, and meet as many people as possible and and connect and provide advice. So yeah, so how how long we like how long have you been with McQueen in terms of your yeah. you're an, an associate for a while? Then yeah. did you like, do your studies or whatever to become an advisor? Talk, like talk us through from yeah. an associate to where you are. Yeah, so well, I guess we probably should just go right back to the start. So I didn't really start off as as an advisor. I didn't even mm. when I finished uni, I went to go study pharmacy of all things, and I, and I was actually. A practicing pharmacist for around about sort of seven, eight years exactly. um, after finishing uni. So, um, and I, I mean, the the main reason I did that originally was I wanted to study med. I wanted to go become a doctor. I but when I was studying pharmacy, that I, I I didn't. I looked at a lot of the doctors, and and I'm not I'm not here to throw shade at their medical profession, but there were a lot of doctors that I saw who didn't necessarily enjoy their jobs. Um, they just saw it as I guess a lot of them saw it as a means to an end, which. There's nothing wrong with that if you want to provide for your family and those sorts of things. But to me, the appeal that I had in my head about being a doctor didn't really marry with the reality that I saw when I was studying pharmacy. Yeah. So I sort of got to the end of that. And and me and my wife, we actually got married quite young. So 
And when you're married, you, you kind of need to start earning a living um, and, and other things. And I moved out of home quite young as well. As, so I, I just was like, well, I got this pharmacy degree. I might as well go work as a pharmacist because they're, they're, you know, the money's not too bad. Yep. And work in that, um, sort of worked there, like I said, for eight years, managed pharmacies, had opportunities to go into partnership. But I sort of got to the end of that and realized, I, again, I don't really want to be in this industry for, for, the, for, the, for the future, for, yes. forever. <laughs> Um, and, and when I was sort of taking a bit of a step back to think about, well, where do I really want to go into? What do I want to do with my life? What sort of lifestyle do I want to have? Um, and how, because we were thinking about a family, well, I think we had started a family and, and, and other things like that. And really I kept coming back to a lot of my, um, friends and family and, and even, um, like my, my church community and other things like that would come to me to talk through finances and help them budget and help them plan even just simple things like consolidate your super like i know that's technically financial advice but at the time you can be ignorant and, and <laughs> just you know pointing people in the right direction but they yeah i did a lot of that and i actually got a lot of enjoyment and uh, friends that had gotten into advice and they were they were really enjoying it and and really i did i did some uh work experience i just randomly started calling financial firms and asking them hey can i just come work for a day for free, you know, and just learn about the industry, understand it. And everything I saw, I was really intrigued and, and, and I really wanted to get into it. So I enrolled in a master's of financial planning. Uh, so it didn't just take a little step. I just jumped into it because uh, I was looking to make that transition, but a lot of people were looking at me saying, you're a pharmacist. Why would we hire you? Like mm. there, there's no chance, all these sorts of things. So I was like, right, I'm going to start my master's. So I started doing that while I was still working as a pharmacist, which when you're a da dad with young kids, it's pretty full on, but we got through it and then made the jump as I was probably about six to 12 months from finishing that master's degree and took a client service job actually with NAB Financial Planning at the time. So um, they, they took a real, I guess, a chance on me in a lot of ways and, and sort of went in there. And from there, I just worked hard. There was about seven restructures. That's probably exaggerating, but there was definitely at least three in my time that I was there. And every time there was a restructure, there was openings for me to sort of jump up in, in I guess, the advice change with, yeah, within um, NAB FP. And the benefit with that was that um, it allowed me to get into an associate role quite quickly. Like I was only in a CSO role for about sort of six months. I mm -hmm. uh, got into an associate role, which got me on the register with about a year to spare before the cutoff happened. So I didn't have to do the PUI. <laughs> um, and then, so, yeah, so there was a lot of the, these sorts of things, which just worked out so incredibly. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, as everyone knows that it was a quite traumatic time for a lot of the banks going through the Royal Commission, being in the middle of that all <laughs> was pretty full on. Um, and also I just didn't, I, I wasn't sure I liked what the outcome was going to be from, the, you know, the the restructures and the sale and all these sorts of things. Cause they were talking about spinning out MLC, but personally, I couldn't see how that was ever going to be received by, by the markets at the, in that environment. And I, again, there was just so much unsure, uncertainty and I just thought they, they, I, I was wrong, luckily, thankful, because I know a lot of people who still work there. I love them, connect with them. There's some people there that were really great to me over the time there. Um, but I was, I, I was like, I think it's a good idea to get out because I can sort of see them turning around and chopping and all these sorts of things, which would have been okay if you're a, a senior advisor, because there was a high chance you probably got to take it with you. But being an associate where you don't really have anything, um, I just didn't see that there was going to be a really great outcome from that. Yeah. So, and then the role from McQueen opened up and, uh, you know, and even May of 2020 when everything else was going on and, and I took the jump there pretty much. So, yeah. 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 So what says so you're getting close to three, four, getting close to four years now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. And so I guess at that point, once I did the the associate jump, well, that, you know, this jumped across the senior associates. So I started doing the work there. And then uh, 2021 was sort of when the first partner left. So I took on that that book and started, I guess, doing that. And, and I guess it just helps in that. I mean, like I, I know a lot of people, a lot of solo advisors have gone out on their own. They've had to go from nothing something and, and it's a grind and it was a grind i was thankful that i guess i was able to sort of put food on the table and having a wage through being a senior associate and picking up other clients along the way but being able to sort of i guess take that jump and sort of get more into what i was comfortable doing which was 
you know, servicing advisors. Yes, it's important to to, to keep engaging and keep bringing on uh, new clients. But uh, and I kept sort of working through that. And then, um, so really, I moved. You know, I stopped being an associate, and a lot, except for a couple of really bigger clients that are mainly Melbourne based. Um, so I helped out a bit there. And then, when the other sort of partner left, um, probably six to twelve months later, that's when I took over the full um, the full business of Brisbane. So yeah. uh, and, and sort of overseeing it up here. So yeah. So what yeah. what so what is the what does your Brisbane Brisbane office look like at the moment then? Yeah, yeah. So really, it's just me and and another support person um, yeah. up here at the moment. I do get a lot of support from from Melbourne, so I lean on. There's an associate in particular. His name's Greg. He's awesome. I just want to shout him out because he's a cool guy. He'll but he, <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe he probably won't listen to this. I'm just kidding, no. But um, he he um, so I lean on him for a lot of uh sort of associate help and in sort of being a point person with client, particularly with new clients coming on board, just having a person who can take them through that process um, yep. and sort of be that that go to person. Another, but like I said, in Brisbane, and then there's some other sort of brokers support up in Brisbane. Um, we don't really have accounting or anything like that. Uh, well, accountants based in Brisbane just yet. Um, it's sort of mainly just sort of broking in FP on the ground. We do service a lot of clients through through accounting because, I mean, in the world of Zoom, that's that's sort of the way it goes. But I guess from where I sit, and I know that you know this is sort of what we'll get a lot of people in, in Melbourne, a lot of the other partners, we really want to see. Brisbane become it's it's sort of its own thing eventually. So yeah. very much standing on its own feet, holistic, um, and looking to sort of grow and expand. But yeah, really, our teams are around about sort of uh, five people up here in Brisbane yeah. at the moment. So yeah. So is it is so there's is a mortgage broker with you? Is there? Is it yeah. So the broker European sort of floats country? between. Yeah. So the broker he floats between um, Melbourne and and Brisbane. Yeah. Um, but like his support staff are in Brisbane. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. Right. I want to go back to the. You spoke about when, you know, you were you're having this idea of the cold career change thing. Yeah. It's yeah. somewhat cold calling financial advice businesses and offering to work for a day a week for free or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So were you still working as a pharmacist at that point? Yeah. So I I had this, I had a roster at that time and it was brutal. It was four 12 and a half hour days. <laughs> and so the fifth day I would have a three day weekend every week, which was, you know, how, how it sort of worked, yeah. which was great um, in some ways. Pretty brutal in others. Being on your feet for 12 and a half hours a day yeah, is always yeah. pretty on. But um, yeah, so like I had a free day every Friday. And so when I decided I wanted to do this, I sort of was like, well, look, you know, can I come, you know, do once a fortnight? I figured once a week would probably be too much. So I offered to come in once a fortnight just to be in the office. You can get me to do whatever you want, but I just want to just learn and grow and understand what what it actually involves and understand yeah. what, what this could look like for, you know, and if I wanted have a future in this and did you find did you find some businesses that were willing to take you on yeah yeah there was sort of there were three that um that that gave me the opportunity one in particular said look you know to be honest we were kind of pseudo job interviewing you as well because we're always looking for people and and um but they were uh like i guess they were down to the you know a bit of the older model which was high sales like we'll put you on but we're not going to pay any wage but you can be an fe and then sort of go and build your book from here yeah which I, I mean, at that point in my life, I probably wasn't confident enough to to, to go out and do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, it, and, it, and I think that, you know, um, that I guess sales is the part, I guess, of what we do. But having that high sales IQ where you back yourself to go and do that, um, you know, they they said I could do that if I wanted to. And I, I just said, look, I don't think that I can <laughs> really do that for now, especially, especially because... Well, you know, and this was back when all you needed was the, you know, the DFP and you're up and running. And so they were sort of like, yeah, well, we'll, you know, you can go do that and then we'll send you off on your own. And I'm like, I don't really have much experience. I don't know what I'm going to talk to clients about and like, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Doesn't make you feel good. Yeah. No, I just, I think that, yeah, from, from my background and with everything, I, I think that if you're going to help clients, you need to know what you're talking about at least. Yeah. So that's probably a base level. And that's, that's probably the benefit of, of advice being professionalized like it has so in so many ways so, so who, who are you working with like what, what are your typical clients look like at the moment yeah yeah so probably i mean traditionally it's been probably a lot more that pre immediate that, that last sort of bit of um working life before retirement and then into retirement years but yeah. lately i've been in the i've actually been working with clients a lot more i guess earlier in, in the piece so people who are in their 40s to 50s high income earners or 
business owners in particular. I've been doing yes. a lot of work with business owners, which is awesome. It's, it's really exciting, I guess. And sort of, I guess, preparing for retirement earlier. But I, I'm also finding that a lot of these people um, who have worked really hard, who have, I guess, you know, extracted their pound of flesh over that period of time, 60 for retirement isn't what they're thinking about. They're thinking about retirement or different jobs or changing roles or going to something less stressful in their fifties. So, um, which is awesome. It's exciting. So, and so that's where a lot of, um, I guess the newer clients that I'm working with, uh, um, you know, a lot of discussions we're having at the moment is so, yeah. Can, yeah. You, can you talk me through the way you engage with these types of clients? Like, what, hey, like yeah. what, what's, what's your meeting process? What are you talking yeah. about? What are you doing with them? Well, it's probably quite fluid. Again, I think I said earlier on, I'm not afraid to try different things and, and I'm pretty experimental in my, not experimental, but lately my, the approach I've been taking is, look, I guess I've, I've developed quite a, you know, quite a few centers of influence. Um, we also have quite a few, I guess, in, you know, internal referrals that do come along as well. But essentially what happens is, is that there's a, there's a connection that's made normally from one of the centers of influence by email. So I'll make a call where I sort of introduce myself, touch base, um, explain who I am, um, just get an idea and a feel for, um, I guess sometimes you can get connected, like get referred a person who probably doesn't need financial advice. It's probably more, you need to go talk to an accountant or you need to do this. So yeah. just try and vet that out at least initially. Um, but I, I don't want to go into too much detail because again, it's just sort of a 10 to 15 minute chat, just to introduce myself, put a, you know, so they know my voice, they're not just getting a random email. So then I'll send out like, I guess a, an introductory email, which pretty much has a calendly meeting where they can schedule a meeting to touch base. Most of my meetings are via like teams with calendly. I sometimes do face to face if it works better in, a, in, in the office, occasionally get on the road if it's, um, it, it, it it de- depends with that from that point of view, but try not to get on the road that much. I think with a family, it, it just takes up so much time unless you can sort of go to a location and just do things back to back. Um, so I'll send that out with, um, and once they made the booking, the way we've got things set up is that they get uh, a pre-appointment um, then through My Prosperity. We sort of have our own, we've got our own sort of portals through it. Right. And it's just very, very cool, very, very functional in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, that goes out to them. They complete that. Um, we go into the, the, we go, we have the introductory meeting where I'm just trying to figure out what's the advice that we're trying to get on top of here. Um, how can I help them um, from that? And and then sort of in that meeting, we position what's called a strategy meeting, which is the the follow-up meeting or, a, you know, a strategy discussion. It's not really a strategy. It's more a discussion. And so at the end of that meeting, we'll position that. So we don't charge for the introductory meeting, but we do charge for that strategy discussion. Um, so the strategy discussion is, I guess, based on that meeting where we've understood the scope, what we're trying to do, the advice, getting a basic understanding. Uh, after that meeting, if we're moving forward to that, we'll do all the research and I'll pick that in here um, just so we can get a bit better of an idea. And really, I see that strategy meeting as I'm just throwing a whole bunch of mud against the wall and seeing what sticks. So a lot of the time I'll have a pretty good idea about what's going to be the best for the client or what the client will want to do. But often I won't just go there with one strategy. I'll go there with what I think would be the best or an ideal strategy, but then I'll throw some random other ones out there just to see how they respond. And I find that quite good in terms of if a, if a client wants to purchase an investment property, for instance, and and just you know, I just might do a crazy one where there's a whole bunch of leverage where they're you know going up to the absolute maximum and just seeing how they react to the repayments that might result from that or other things like that because it often fleshes out quite good discussions that can help me help you know me understand a bit more. Okay, just I'm just trying to bring as much stuff to light um, so that we can really dive down in that in that strategy discussion and walk out of there with. And, and from there, obviously, we'll go to, you know, SOA preparation and, you know, advice meetings and, and implementation after that. But that that strategy, we just invest the time um, and just go from there. So, yeah. Are you, are you using any tools to help you with that? Are you modeling or anything? Or yeah. Obviously, what, what, that strategy doing? meeting will use X tools. So, I run okay. a few X tool scenarios. Yep. It's not, um, like, I, and I say that to clients, it's not, it's not, I can't, it's not fun as, financial advice it's all general and it's and it really we're just working in there to try and refine whatever strategy we're going to go with mm. for the advice document and so often like i said we'll have a few different lines and things like 
Um, they might be like I had clients recently that were really focused on reducing their tax. So we were, I, I, I sort of had net assets because we want to get a good outcome for them from that side, but I showed them, okay, well, this is your tax position, how much better. And I'll just include different slides from, from X tools. So generally that strategy meeting, I'll throw together a bit of a PowerPoint slide where I try to be, and, and some people, you might've seen this or other people might've seen this. I, I, I do like these looms, um, where I put up like often what I do in the discussions and uh-huh. they're often float. Yep. Yeah, there's flow charts that sort of run through where I try to sort of show the strategy like like that. In that meeting, I'll have like some of those X tools charts in there. And um, yeah, so mainly just X tools and really it's just a PowerPoint presentation yeah. with what we've found from X tools and what we've found from the initial sort of um, research and and where where they're currently at in their situation. So yeah, yeah, I found that process. I I I I don't know why, but I don't currently do that process that you're yeah. articulating. But yeah. I did for a very, very long time. And it's just what, like one of the younger guys in my team, we're having this, this similar conversation just on yeah. and saying, Hey, Jane, I need some help with this bit. And I said, You've got to get into, you've got to get into the frame of mind of kind of positioning the strategy with the client before you're rushing off to try and do statements of advice. Yeah. It helps. Yeah. I find it helps really well, like with you coming up with the ideas anyway. You like, you kind of follow your own process. You spend some time in your own head and modeling and whatever mm-hmm. and putting it all together. Um, it helps you with obviously with working out the advice and then yeah. positioning with the clients so they know what they're getting before they commit too too far. Works really well. Well, I think as well, clients often you know, it, it, and it's they often don't know what they want. Um, yeah. And I, I, everyone says that, and you've probably experienced it. Um, and you sort of you walk into some meetings, it's like, well, what are you wanting to achieve? And they're like, uh, they're like a deer in the headlights sometimes. Yeah. And you you can only draw out so much of them at certain meetings and sometimes it takes just putting stuff up visually to make them go oh okay and th- there was one client that i can think of who was like we would he, he initially said i want to retire at 60 and then we sort of threw that out there and i sort of was showing some of the 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 net assets and you know retirements and and even just like look he wanted to have 120 grand per annum in retirement which that's pretty pretty aggressive spending not i mean there's people that do more but but if you're planning to do that at 60, you got to make sure you have a pretty good asset base. So, mm. but he was doing the rate he was saving, he could save. I said, well, there's a, there's a potential you could look to bring it forward to 55. We just probably wouldn't put everything in superannuation. We'd probably do it a bit differently and other things like that. And, and, and all of a sudden he got really laser focused on, okay, 55 then. And I sort of felt like I'd backed myself into a corner. <laughs> now I've got to try and figure this out. But like, but realistically, I think that he, I think it articulate. I think he probably wanted to say fifty five, but he was trying to be realistic and sort of like, I'll oh, I'll just do sixty. But when you when they see that and when they they open their eyes to it, I think that's yeah. At the end of the day, that's all, that's the value of advice. That's the value that we provide clients and. And that really what what this profession is all about, and the reason I got into it was clients that they they might not know what they know, they don't know, um, but it's our job to even pull out the stuff that they might have deep down inside of them that they've never really even thought about, and you know show that that is possible and work work towards that. Yep. I want to spend you spend a bit of time. You you mentioned this idea of centers of influence. Like, well, where yeah. do your clients yeah. where do your clients come from? You know, you, you've You've had a, a pretty steep learning curve, and and, and you kind of you know, four years or so, you've gone from being an associate advisor to be the you know, the advisor running the running the office. How have you gone about finding new clients to help? Because as you said, it, you know, a, a part of, a part of part of being a financial advisor is you need people to agree to to buy the service that you're selling, so that otherwise exactly. the business isn't yeah. going to exist. Yeah. How have you gone about finding new clients, developing? Referral sources or centers of influence, whatever you want to call it. What what have you done? Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to lie. I'm still pretty early in the journey, so <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are doing a much better job than me. And but really, for me, I've just come at it from a point of view of I, I've joined I've joined like some networking groups um, and just sort of trialed that that option. But it, but I came at it. I initially went to networking groups because I wanted to find people I could trust to send my clients to more than anything. Right. Yep. And I, I sort of came at it from the point of view, I want to connect with people who I think are trustworthy, who are going to look after my clients as good as me, because uh, if I make a connection, 
there's an inbuilt measure of trust that's being transferred to them. And if they, they stuff that up, then that doesn't reflect well on you at all. Yeah. And I think through just doing that, I've built, um, like the things too many people, they approach, um, you know, I mean, let's just say a mortgage broker, for instance, and go to them and say, you know, how can you, how can you send me business? And it's like, well, that, that's not really going to achieve too much. You're better off coming from the point of view of how can I help you? What sort of questions do you have? What sort of value? Because they might a lot of the time they've probably got some sort of relationship, you know, set up or whatever, um, and that that's fine, that's cool. But if you if you just want to find someone who is trustworthy, who who's going to do a good job, and you can show them, oh wow, this person really cares for client, this real person really values his clients, and he's trusting me with them, that and I can see the awesome work he's doing over here then you all of a sudden come to the front of their mind and they think when they have a client who might be ideal for you, they I've started having a lot of them reach out to me and say, well, look, Chris, who are the people that you're looking to connect with? And that's why I said, look, business owners in their 40s, high-income professionals who might want to transition away from their job at some point, you know, those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And they so they have that front and center in their mind. Now, they might not send every opportunity my way, but they know, okay, this is the person that Chris is looking to connect with at the moment. And if it comes along, then I'll make that introduction. Yeah. So, and, and look, like I said, I mean, that's really only started to get traction in the last six months. Really? I've probably been doing the networking thing for probably 12 to 13 months. Um, but I think too, as well, like I had clients who were brokers. So I reached out to them and said, Hey, you know, let's, let's have a connection. I had clients who were buyers agents. I had um, you know, I had accountants who, who were friends. I had other friends. I think you can utilize your friendship networks and, and probably your existing base too, to sort of like, well, look, you're a client. I want you to do well because I want, I care about you financially. Is there any way that, you know, I, I can understand your business cause I could potentially send, you know, and then, so you're helping them. They help you. I think as long as you adopt the mindset of I'm here to serve, I'm here to give, um, not a, you know, I, I, and that. I genuinely think a lot of the people that I built relationships well with, if I didn't get anything back from them, but I knew that I could trust them with a client, I, that that's that's the big tick for me. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think I don't know. It just it just feels like that the more you give out, the more you you are willing to invest in other people, then you know you just receive it back. So. I think I think you're right. I, I think you've articulated it well. This idea of too many people go into go to a networking event or whatever, and they go and say, yeah. "How can I get out of this as much as possible?" Yeah. But you've gone into yeah. it with a mindset of, "Well, how can I give as much as possible?" Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're trying to find people that you can connect with, and all the rest of it, and trustworthy with your clients and, and the like. But yeah. you've gone in there with a giving mindset rather than a taking mindset. Yeah, and it's amazing how the world eventually turns around back in your favour, and yeah, it comes back to you. So you're still attending the networking events. Are you still doing that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, still do that. Um, I just the one I go to, the, I go to BX, um, but it, and so the, it's 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 quite good. It's quite relaxed. It's more focused on personal growth, yes, and sort of building a really strong community. Um, and so yeah, it's, I, I find it quite good. I generally only go once a month. I know they're on fortnightly, but again, young family. <laughs> it's sort of in the morning. Yeah, my wife would probably kill me if I was. Uh, you know, bailing on you know school school readiness fortnightly every Thursday. So I I, I just generally aim for once a month, and and I find that just showing my face there and and connecting with people, and and I, and as well, I've developed so many connections with people outside of it now, and that yeah, it, it's sort of less about turn, showing my face in this you know every fortnight, and more about just keeping the community going and 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 helping people. So yeah, yeah. and it, it you know something you mentioned is something that we encourage a lot of our our up and coming advisors to do as well. Like particularly if you find yourself in a situation like you did where you, where you've taken over an existing client base, you know, different you mentioned different partners partners leaving. It, it, in that op- as you're getting to know those clients and who do they work with? Like who is their accountant? Who's their mortgage broker? This kind of thing. There's the doors open to then all of a sudden say, Oh, if they talk highly of their accountant to say, Oh, do you mind if I give them a call and introduce yeah. myself as your financial advisor exactly. that's taken over? Yeah. And you never know where that might might take you absolutely. Yeah, good. Yeah. So, what, what are your what are your plans from here? What are you? I think you're trying to. You mentioned before about building out the Brisbane office, but what? Yeah. Are you, no. What are you? What are you hoping to try and achieve? I think for me personally, I just probably need to grow in um in many ways. I still I still have so much to learn as an advisor. Really. Yeah. Uh, I've grown so much, but I have had 
you know, a bit of a expedited journey. Um, and there's good things with that. There's bad things with that. I mean, like I, I, I'm thankful that I have a lot of support to, to help lean on and sort of f- f- from that side. But I think, yeah, in, in the short term, my, my, a lot of my focus is just on really continuing to build the relationships I have with clients to keep connecting and bringing on new clients. And yeah, that we're looking to, we're starting discussions around, well, what does it look like for me to have an associate up here? Yep. What does it look like to um, potentially add in, um, add on another advisor, but it'd probably, I'd probably more lean towards bringing on someone, bring it, putting them through their PY and then starting to hand off clients from myself. Again, I've heard mixed feedback around those sort of arrangements. I, I, I'm probably more inclined to go down that route, but I think it just comes down to just getting the right person, investing the time with them and sort of working with them because Really, I'm only here today because people trusted me. Even back in NAB FP days, the reason I had any sort of gumption to be able to take over clients and do this was because I was able to call clients as an associate and connect with them and talk with them. The advisors really trusted me to do that and build relationships with people. So um, I'd like to be able to do that myself at some point, which which would be exciting. But I think as well, I just need to sort of grow in terms of my leadership, heading up an advice business and like to be able to grow something like that, that's a holistic business and, and sort of really connect with the right people to whether that, you know, that's by acquisition, which we're open to, or whether that's by, you know, people coming, you know, putting people on and sort of helping them to grow and, and those sorts of things. We're, we're sort of open to all avenues, but I know that to be able to do that, I need to grow both in my leadership capacity um, and also just in my ability to, you know, manage teams and, and those sorts of things. So yeah, that's sort of where I'm at is for you. I'm a, I'm yeah. a advocate for the, the whole associate advisor piece to yeah try and like the, the 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 advisor to try and bring someone in to be the associate advisor, put them through a professional year, gives them an opportunity in front of the clients, and then it makes that it makes them taking over looking after the clients so much easier for you if they've been involved with the client for a year or two up until that point makes yeah. makes everyone's life a whole lot easier. But yeah, lots of opportunity yeah. ahead for you by the sounds of things. Absolutely. I mean, it's like I said, it's an exciting time to be in Brisbane, and um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, it's just an exciting time to be in advice anywhere. To be honest with you, I think that with the right mindset, and then if you're if you're willing to put the work in, I think that. Oh, and I mean, it's such a rewarding career as well. At the end of the day, like it's far exceeded my expectations in in so many ways, and um, yeah, I'm just thankful for everyone who's played a part in the journey, and hopefully, I get to play my part particularly with the industry moving forward and then doing my little bit to help other people, but also help the industry too moving yeah, forward. Perfect. So, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Look, thanks for joining me today, Chris. Great to have you. Great to speak with you. Keep up no your problem. videos. They do, I do see them pop up on my LinkedIn with your little face in the corner and you're explaining something. <laughs> But it's yeah, just another I don't want the whole face there. up there because I'm, I'm, you know, I don't look too good. Like, you know, <laughs> I shrink it down. So I don't have to do makeup and all these sorts of things before I go live. But, you know, it's it. All right. Thanks, Chris. Good to speak with you. Thanks, James. Bye now.